my name is Lisa Galia, and I'm uh, the lead of the Women's Health Cluster. And together with uh, Yavin Mofagi and Center for Brain Health and the Women's Health Cluster, we're putting together this event called Sex Cells, which we, basically we stole from uh, Healthy Brains, Healthy Lives, <laughs> and uh, which is at McGill University, which Crystal Van Hoof. Um, uh, organized in December, I guess, of last year. And both of us were speakers and we had such a good time that I asked Crystal if she would be willing to do this at uh, UBC as well. But um, obviously in our beautiful virtual ver world these days, we can open us up to uh, many other universities. So we have many representatives from across Canada and if they're joining today, uh, worldwide, which is really fun. Uh, so uh, before we begin, I just wanted to uh, uh, make a land acknowledgement, and I realized that we're not all in Canada, um, so I encourage you to, in your own country and place of uh, living, uh, research the uh, Indigenous people of your um, land. So here I would like to recognize that we live, work, and play and participate in a community on the unceded, ceded and traditional territories of 203 First Nations, along with 38 Métis chartered communities, each of which possess their own unique traditions and history here on this land that we now refer to as British Columbia. That's where I am right now. We acknowledge the importance of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada's call to action the United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the BC Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act. In all of our work, we're committed to ensuring Indigenous women's rights to health and safety and equal opportunity to participate in a manner that recognizes and respects Indigenous cultures and traditions. Today, I'm joining you from North Vancouver, as a matter of fact, which is part of the unceded homelands of the Coast Salish peoples and the traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh -Tooth First Nations. Uh, a little bit about the Women's Health Cluster. We have over 260 members worldwide. It, it did start at UBC, but it's meant to be worldwide. We hold a number of uh, events, including trainee uh, research presentations. There's one coming up, I think, very soon, uh, but please take a look at our website and you'll be able to see all of the things that we offer. We um, also have uh, trainee travel awards. Of course, nobody's traveling right now, but um, there are registration awards that are open to everyone. And let me just say that success, success rates are really high. So you might want to join just so that you can participate in some of these awards that we're giving out. We've got some new ones coming up as well. Uh, we can't do all of this without our support that we have. So we uh, tip our hat to uh, UBC's uh, Canadian Institutes of Health Research. Uh, including Elizabeth Ryder, who donated part of her sex and gender chair to the cluster, as well as the Michael Smith Foundation for Health Research. Um, and if you're interested in becoming a member, just please uh, look at our website. So while I am introducing Crystal, who will speak, so the way this will work is that we'll have Crystal speak first on sex and gender in general, um, and then we'll have a small Q&A, and then I'll talk a little bit about some um, sex-specific um, uh, considerations in biomedical research. And then we'll open it up for Q&A and then uh, we'll have a bunch of breakout rooms where people can go and ask more questions. Uh, and uh, uh, before um, I introduce Crystal, maybe, um, Catherine, could you share the poll that we created really quickly? Um, I should have uh, told you that I was gonna do this, there it is. So um, I, I just wanted to get an idea of, what might your barriers be for integrating SGBA into your work? And maybe there are no barriers. I don't know if we uh, added that um, at all. <laughs> so if not, just choose other. Um, but please do um, let me know because uh, I don't, don't see anyone voting yet. <laughs> but, um, oh, the poll got closed very quickly. Uh, maybe we can relaunch the polling because nobody voted. I think I did that. Oh. <laughs> I thought I was just closing it for myself. No, you guys are very Hey, yay, thank you, a couple, six people have voted. Okay, thank you. Because um, I'm really interested and curious to know um, about what, what might these barriers be? Because I have ideas in my head about what they might be, but they might not be what uh, the barriers truly are. Um, so we're gonna launch that again at the end of the uh, meeting as well to see if anything has changed your mind. So um, Crystal, you can start sharing your slides and I will introduce you. So uh, Crystal, over the last two past two decades, Crystal has led a variety of leadership positions within the federal government, the, the United Nations and the nonprofit sector. 
Uh, most recently, and this is where I met her, she was the Assistant Director of the Canadian Institute of Health Research Institute of Gender and Health, where uh, Crystal promoted the integration of sex and gender across uh, health research disciplines and ensured research findings got into the hands of people who could use them to address pressing health challenges facing men, women, girls, boys, and gender diverse people. And now Crystal is Managing Director and CEO of Healthy Brains, Healthy Lives at McGill University, where she is responsible for caring for the strategic vision of the Healthy Brains, Healthy Lives initiative, while overseeing funding programs and partnerships within neuroscience and related communities at McGill. And McGill is truly lucky to have her. <laughs> Um, and uh, I always uh, like to give a fun fact because uh, our speakers are always amazing people. And so Crystal gave me a million fun facts that are really, really, truly fun. Sometimes I give fun facts that are not as fun as I would like. Uh, but uh, the fun fact I'll choose for you is that, and Crystal and I, what you have to understand is we often banter. Um, and uh, uh, I guess I'll share the results while I'm um, talking. We often banter and I should be careful about bantering because she holds a third degree black belt in karate. Is that what you, I forgot to write that part. And Kung Fu, and Kung Fu. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, I gotta be, I gotta watch my step. Okay, and just very quickly <laughs> here, um, uh, as I suspected, there's a number of people that uh, always incorporate um, uh, SGBA. So sometimes I feel like we're preaching to the choir. Um, and, uh, but I'd like to talk a little bit later about match samples versus covariate um, and it costs you too much money. That was probably what I would have guessed, but thank you so much. And we'll relaunch it afterwards too. Thank you. Okay, take it away, Crystal. Okay, thanks very much. Okay. So I thought, since I'm not in the same place that you are, I will do my own uh, land acknowledgement, uh, which is that McGill University is situated on the traditional territory of the Kanyankahaga, a place which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst nations. We recognize and respect the Kanyankahaga as the traditional custodians of the lands and waters on which we meet today, or at least on which I sit today while you meet from elsewhere. <laughs> I'm just going to put this aside so that I can see my screen. So a uh, few things, just to give you an idea of what I'm going to talk about. I thought I would just start with some basics, uh, because I think often with talks like this, uh, we have a variety of people from a variety of different areas and disciplines and with a variety of levels of knowledge when it comes to section gender based analysis. So I'll just start with kind of some terminology and make sure we're all on the same page about what I mean when I use certain words. Talk a little bit about why sex and gender based analysis matters to research with some examples and then give you some reasons why you might want to consider SGBA if you aren't already or some ways that you might consider that you haven't already. Uh, by talking about how it can help you to make discoveries, how it can help you to get published and how it can help you to get funded. So uh, with a caveat to begin with, though, that I always start, which is that this is the 101 version. We are all on different pages and different levels. So I just want to make sure that we understand that uh, there are lots of things that I won't talk about today. So uh, sex is not binary, and I won't talk about that today. But just so you know that I know that. Uh, sex and gender are difficult to tease apart. And while I will talk about sex and gender as distinct concepts, they are not entirely distinct. Um, Gender is, you know, socially determined, culturally based, but it came from somewhere and it is linked to sex in some ways, but those are interesting topics that I won't talk about today. Gender is only one of many intersectional factors affecting health and that's why CIHR in particular talks about sex and gender based analysis plus the plus meaning those intersectional factors like socioeconomic status, race, ethnicity, geography, et cetera, but I won't really be getting into those today. Uh, we'll just be sticking to sex and gender, not to say that they don't matter. They of course do, but again, we only have so much time. We don't have all day. So without further ado, I always like to do a check-in. I know we just did a poll, but like, can as many people as are able and willing put on their videos? Because I really like to get people to raise their hands physically. And it just makes me feel a little bit more connected to the audience in these terrible virtual days of ours. I really appreciate it. Thanks, guys. So put up your hand if you think that sex or gender is relevant to your work. Yes, Lisa. Put up your hand if you think that it isn't relevant to your work. Maybe it's just the people with the, the two people on the poll that don't have their video on. <laughs> so 
Are sex and gender the same thing? Can they be used interchangeably? I did say that they are not entirely distinct concepts, but do you think that the terms can be used interchangeably in health research? Put up your hand if you think that they can be used interchangeably. And put up your hand if you think that they can't be used interchangeably. Put up your hand if you're not sure. You're not sure yet. <laughs> there's always a few like, I'm not sure. And then there's the ones that are always afraid to answer, uh, but that's okay too. So uh, bonus, have you ever used the term gender in a publication when you should have used sex? Anybody? Anybody know that they've done this before? Yeah, yeah. Because I know that sometimes people are like, yeah, I know that they're separate, but I still use gender to talk about mice. No. Okay, so false. Sex refers to biological differences between males and females, like genes, sex, hormones, physiology, and immune response. Whereas gender, when I say gender here, I'm going to be talking about psychosocial characteristics and factors that affect women, boys, girls, and gender diverse people. Now that said, even though when I talk about gender today, that's what I'm gonna be talking about, gender is actually a multi-dimensional concept that includes the roles that you have in society, the identity that you have in terms of, this is how I identify, I identify as a man, I identify as a woman, I identify as cis or trans or whatever it might be. It, it affects your relations. So you have gender relations between people. How are you treated? What are the expectations of you based on the gender that is read of you by society and by people in society? And then institutionalized gender. How are the distributions of power in political and educational and societal institutions distributed? Um, and then those in turn can shape social gender norms. So it's multi multi-dimensional, but I'll generally be talking about what I said before about the psychosocial factors specifically. So the bottom line is that every cell has a sex, every person is gendered, and mice do not have genders. Now, again, by raise of hands, can I see who are our animal researchers? Animal researchers, thank you. Okay, animal researchers now, I want you to turn, unmute yourself. Okay, so animal researchers, I want you to raise your right hand and repeat after me. I solemnly swear on the scientific method. I solemnly swear on the scientific, swear on the scientific method. method. That I will never again refer to the gender of animals. That I will, I will never, never again, again refer to the gender, gender, gender of animals. animals. Until mice are able to communicate their preferred pronouns. <laughs> Until mice, mice are, are able, able to communicate their preferred pronouns. Or Thank worms. you. Or worms, you're or correct. Worms. Yes, or whatever animal it is that you use. I appreciate that and I will hold you to it and I will be checking your publications. Not really, but please pretend that I am. Okay, good. So why, why are sex and gender important to health research other than you know, avoiding me checking your publications and sending you mean emails? So I like to say, uh, and the Institute of Gender and Health also likes to say that women, men, boys, girls, and gender diverse people are equal, but when it comes to our health, differences matter. This is super important, I find in particular, I currently work in neuroscience, Lisa works in neuroscience, and neuroscientists in particular, I find are very afraid of talking about difference because they think that difference means inequality. If your brain is different, is one brain better? No. <laughs> So, but that doesn't mean that differences don't matter and make a difference potentially to your health. On average, we know that men die younger than women while women experience a heavier burden of chronic illness. Is this because of sex? Is this because of gender? Or is it because of a combination of both? Research should tell us. Sex so for example, immune response and gender, for example, people who might think that real men don't wear masks can have a significant implication for COVID-19, just to bring an example that would be relevant for today. We know that men are more likely to smoke, but a woman who smokes the same amount as a man is 20% more likely to develop lung cancer. We know that higher paternal age may increase the risk of negative health outcomes in offspring, for example, autism and schizophrenia, but a host of others, while paternal preconception exposure to pesticides increases risk of childhood leukemia among offspring. However, how many men are getting the, you're not getting any younger talk from their healthcare providers or being prescribed prenatal vitamins? So while there's sex specific differences or effects, 
on the outcomes of offspring, we have a gendered effect in how people are actually treated clinically. So true or false, and we'll raise our hands here, is it safe to assume that conducting single sex preclinical studies will have no effect down the lines in humans? So if you think that it is true that it is safe to assume, <laughs> raise your hand. If you think it's false, raise your hand. If you're not sure, raise your hand. Good, I like the people who admit that they're not sure, that's good. Okay, so false. And I'm not saying that it's true or false necessarily, but it is false that it is safe to assume. And why do we know that it is not safe to assume? Well, we know that cell-based studies are 80% male are not reported, which generally means male. Animal-based studies are 75% male. Human trials are 67% men. And then post-market women are two, have two times the risk of adverse drug reactions. Is this because of the pipeline? Could be. I would argue very, very likely that it has something to do with it. So not safe to assume. So true or false, female rodents are intrinsically more variable than males do their estrus cycle, making them generally less suitable for baseline study models. Who believes this is true? Who believes this is true? I know that someone believes this is true because I saw it in the poll. Yeah, we've got somebody admitting to it down there. Who believes this is false? And who isn't sure? Okay, good. I like it, we're learning. Okay, so <clears throat> two meta-analyses that I know of, and there may have been others since, have found that for most applications, female mice and rats are no more variable than males. So here's a little graph showing from one of those, those studies that I've mentioned here, Pendergast, and showing that actually across metabolism, hormone, and morphology, the males were more variable than the females. So my takeaway here, at least the one that I like to share with my male spouse, is that males might be more hormonal than females, which I think is just wonderful for the terrible stereotypes that women have been having to deal with for a very, very long time. So something to think about. Now, this is what I've heard generally is that the, the idea here being that caging, I guess, um, and Lisa will correct me if I'm wrong here, I'm sure, that, that the males tend to fight and that can affect the testosterone. So when you're looking at variability, it's not just the female hormones that need to be considered, right? So the thing that I like to ask though, is that even if females were more variable than males, should that justify their exclusion from preclinical research? If I'm showing that the males are more variable, does that mean that now should all switch to females and not study males? Is that what that means? Because that seems to be the argument. They're more variable, so they should be left out. So that now I've shown you the males are more variable. So does that mean that they should be left out? And I would say no. <laughs> females are females. They are not just males plus messy variables, nor are males just females plus messy variables, right? So anyway, I'll just leave that one with you. Um, so then talking about how SGBA can open doors for you in those three areas that I mentioned earlier. Um, opportunities for discovery. So because I'm from McGill, I'm going to give you a couple of McGill examples. Um, so Dr. Jeffrey Mogul, who studies pain uh, in rodents, uh, found a number of years ago now that different immune cells mediate mechanical pain hypersensitivity in male and female mice. So there was this assumption for a very long time that microglial cells were responsible for mediating mechanical pain hypersensitivity. And it was basically because no one had bothered to do the research in females. And so Jeff did and found that when he turned off the microglial cells, it actually had no effect on the pain transmission in the females, which was very surprising. And even more surprising than that is how it hasn't changed pain research very much. And uh, um, Jeff actually put out a commentary in Nature a few years ago showing that even though he has shown all of these incredible sex differences in pain research, it strangely has not changed the field of pain research all that much, which is disheartening to say the least. But I would say just looking at Jeff's success in research, there's opportunities there for your research if you choose to look at sex and gender. So then another example, getting into maybe more gendered effects, also from McGill is Dr. Louise Pilet, who was able to show that gender was more predictive than sex of acute coronary syndrome. And so what Dr. Pilet 
showed was that higher feminine gender score, but not female sex was associated with higher rates of recurrent acute coronary syndrome. So what she did was create a seven, a compilated seven point measure of gender within her cohort, applied it to her cohort and found that if you, if you look at this as the, the blue line are the biological females, the red line are the biological males. So what she did was she created this gender measure asking people all, all kinds of questions about things that are generally considered to be gendered, found out what in her cohort was more likely to be answered in the survey by the biological males versus the biological females, and then called that gender, right? And so then once you did that, then you applied it to your cord and said, okay, where do people fall on the spectrum, right? And this is basically what this graph shows is that females were maybe a little bit more spread out across the masculine feminine and males were much more towards what were considered the masculine characteristics. The masculine characteristics here again, being defined by those characteristics that were most likely to be found in biological males in her cohort. So this wasn't based on stereotypes. This was based specifically on her cohort. And so you can imagine why this, this distribution might be true, because even though we're getting, you know, better and better with gender equality, there still is a lot of stigma, a lot more stigma around how men are supposed to act. And they are meant, they are expected to be more masculine than women are expected to be more feminine, I would argue, at least in our culture. And this was a study in Montreal. So then what she found was on this chart, the, the people who were more likely to be on the feminine side of things, whether they were the red line or the blue line, were more likely to have a second heart attack within a year of their first heart attack. That was, that was her finding. So very interesting way to look at gender there. So publishing requirements, I'll just go through a few of these quickly. So there's lots of publishing requirements and there's guidelines on how to do it right sex and gender equity and research guidelines, the ARRIVE guidelines. There's journals, lots and lots of them that have requirements to integrate sex and gender. There's instructions for authors and for reviewers. So this is just important in publishing as it is in, in all things more and more. Um, and then in terms of funding, lots and lots of funding policies around the world and more all the time. The, I just added this one this morning, Horizon Europe has added something about not just sex and gender, but they call it the gender dimension in Europe, but it is sex and gender, but also about um, equity, diversity and inclusion in research is all part of the Horizon Europe um, plan, which is the, the new Horizon 2020, for those of you who know that one. Uh, and of course, for those of us in Canada, the CIHR sex and gender based analysis action plan, which was launched in 2018 would be the one that's most relevant for us here. So I'll just talk about that just a little bit. So if you have ever applied to CIHR, you will have seen what we call the box, which is this question that everyone is asked, which is, uh, is sex relevant, is gender relevant? And if yes or if no, please explain. Um, so everyone has to answer this and has had to answer this since 2010. The problem was that people were answering it, but the reviewers weren't necessarily looking at it, or if they were, they weren't necessarily providing feedback, and there wasn't a specific space for reviewers to provide feedback. And so in 2018, CIHR launched the Sex and Gender-Based Analysis Action Plan, which then required the chair and scientific officer to complete one of the Institute of Gender and Health online training modules. They had to have people with expertise actually on the review committee. Sex and gender resource section was added to the CIHR website, including a one pager, resources and a video, and a feedback box was added for the peer reviewers. So they had to say whether sex and gender was a strength, a weakness, or not applicable, each separately, and then provide feedback on potentially how to improve. Um, so you can see there, if you go to sgreview.ca, there's a video and the training modules that CIHR uh, has put out are at discoversexandgender.ca. So that's it for me and uh, happy to take a few questions if there's time. There is time. So uh, don't be shy. You can put questions in the chat or you can unmute yourself. Uh, and then uh, after a very short period of time, I'm going to make Crystal introduce me <laughs> and I'll do, and Crystal took some of my talking points, but that's okay because it's good to, um, to reiterate them. Um, so are there any 
question and we'll have it we, we'll have a longer one after the second talk too but are there any questions again don't be shy raise your hand elizabeth rideau please unmute yourself to ask your question hey that was great crystal thank you so Thanks. much i really like i love these i'm obviously a convert but you know <laughs> I, I love these talks anyways um the one curiosity so my lab decided to do because of covid and virtual projects so we decided to do like an implementation study, right? And we were like, cool. just looking at the behavior of researchers in a certain field over the past 20 years. And so we just actually finished, so it was like 99, 2009 and 2019. And just looking at, you know, the inclusion of sex and gender and stuff like that in, in um, it, just in one flagship journal of a field. Cool. And it was actually, I'm not gonna lie, a little bit disheartening um, sure. because base, the only thing that's happened is that fewer people just don't mention anything. But in terms of increasing, most of the increase is just going to this category where people are using both sexes, but they don't analyze anything by sex or in humans, gender. So basically people are just lumping both sexes together. And, and, and that even that change was like, absolutely minimal and so you know I guess like I'm super into it and I promote it and 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 stuff like that but you know people are not you know researchers are limited sometimes by how like it, the money is really limiting right mm -hmm. so what people have done is like oh well I'll use five animals and I'll use three females and two males or three males and two females or four and one or whatever because people don't have enough money to do 10 and 10 or even five and five can be a bit tough so you know, what do you think is the way forward? Because, you know, I, I was like, I think this is changing. And then, you know, yeah. when we analyzed it, in fact, it, it really wasn't. So, you know, what, how are we going to resolve this? Because it's been a long time. And yeah, I think there's a couple of things based on what you just said. One is, I think that the journals need to be stricter about forcing yeah. people to disaggregate and show their data. Um, that's something that the Institute of Gender and Health has been working on by going to publishers of journals because it's easier than going to individual journals, but it takes time to, they're big ships to turn, you know, but I think that the more that researchers expect to see it, the more that they're required to review it as part of, you know, CIHR, for instance, the more that they're the same reviewers, the more that hopefully they will review these things when it comes to published works as well. Um, so that's, that's one thing. In terms of the money, uh, I know what, uh, what the Institute of Gender and Health always says, which is if you need more money to study, to study sex, just ask for it. And if somebody tells you they're going to cut your budget because you want to study more animals, because you want to study sex, then just email Kara to Hannah <laughs> because she's the one who always says, call me, email me, tell me if they do that, because she said, I've never heard of anyone having that budget cut because they said that they needed more money to study more animals to study sex, for instance. Well, right. But it's, it's not that simple either. No, I right? know. I know because, it's not, I know, you know, like, but at the same limited. time, CIHR has to expect that if they're requiring this, that there can be a follow-up cost. I think everyone has been understandably reticent to add that cost. Um, mm -hmm. Right. But at a certain point, there needs to be an expectation that that will happen. So well, is it, I have is to, um, I have, of X? oh, okay, go ahead. Sorry. I'm sorry. We have to <laughs> keep moving to keep on time, uh, Elizabeth, but uh, uh, yes, uh, we, we did our own study, as you know, uh, pretty much showing the same thing, uh, but, and I have one slide on it in my own presentation, but um, Magdalena also had her hand up. I don't know. Do you, yeah. do you want to? It's a quick question. Um, sure. Thank you, Crystal, for, for, for your wonderful presentation. I study the, the human pregnant brain, so this is a very important topic um, for me. Just like um, Lisa. <laughs> um, yeah, I know her. I know her. <laughs> um, so I was wondering about this study that you explained um, where they found like the higher feminine characteristics were associated with higher recurrent acute coronary disease. Um, mm -hmm. did they do they interpret this result? Um, is there any highlight? Like, is there, how do they explain this? It, 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 is it because the, the way of living of those people that um, have feminine characteristics? I think that there wasn't one specific thing. I think that everyone has their pet theories as to why this might be, you know, like 
more likely to have household responsibilities, more likely to have to look after caregiving responsibilities. Those types of things tend to be associated with female sex and thus because it's not a biological thing, it's a, it's a gendered factor. So those are the types of things you might expect uh, that would make you less likely to recover well after a heart attack. So that would be one. And then the other thing that could be associated with it is uh, socioeconomic status, if, you know, um, which can have a whole host of different effects, right? Sure. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Magdalena. It's actually a really interesting study. Uh, so I encourage you to, to to go back and take a look at it. Uh, Crystal, can well, I'll I introduce, you to introduce me? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so Lisa, I'm very happy to introduce Lisa Guglia, a good friend of mine who I love to argue with. Um, Lisa Guglia is a professor in psychology, affiliated member in psychiatry, member of the, I can't say it, I tried, Yavid Mofagian? Sure, Yavid <laughs> Mofagian, yep. Okay, Center for Brain Health and UBC Health Advisor at the University of British Columbia and a scientific advisor at Women's Health Research Institute. She is the lead for the Women's Health Research Cluster. The main goal of her research is to improve brain health for women and men by examining the influence of sex and sex hormones on normal and disease brain states such as depression and Alzheimer's disease. Dr. Galea is a distinguished university scholar, twice winner of the Natural Science and Engineering Research Council of Canada's Discovery Accelerator and a Community Engagement Award Vancouver YMCA Women of Distinction Award. She has given over 60 international speaking engagements, including keynotes. Lisa sits on the advisory board of the Institute of Gender and Health and the University Delegates Executive Committee at Canadian Institutes for Health Research. She was recognized as a fellow at International Behavioral Neuroscience Society and the Cavill Foundation. Dr. Glia is the chief editor of Frontiers in Neuroendocrinology and the president-elect of the Organization for the Study of Sex Differences. She serves on committees, boards, and boards, including Canadian Organization for the Sex and Gender Research, Canadian Organization for Sex and Gender Research. But you are on too. I know, I am too, so I should be able to say it. <laughs> International Behavioral Neuroscience Society, Society for Behavioral Neuroendocrinology, and Canadian Association of Neuroscience. And Lisa's fun fact is that in her last two years of high school, she co-wrote and co-directed her high school's musicals, which is amazing. And they were about the Academy Awards and a dating game cruise ship, sort of like the love boat, which I find fascinating and hope there's a VHS somewhere. <laughs> I think there might be. Oh, that would be embarrassing to watch, uh, but I'm not on the stage, so that's it's not too embarrassing. Um, okay, so thank you very much. I hope that um, uh, I am at 20 minutes. I might uh, skip a couple of slides just to keep us on time, but I, I just wanted to give us some other examples of sex differences. Uh, and so there are a lot number of sex differences in the brain itself. A lot of meta-analysis showing that there are many regions in the brain, blue they are colored, that are have more gray matter in males compared to females and just as many brain areas where females have more gray matter than males. In terms of connective uh, tissue within the brain, uh, males are more likely to have intra-hemispheric connect, connect, connections and females are more likely to have inter-hemispheric connections. And what all of these things might indicate or they might be involved in why we see a number of sex differences in prevalence of brain disease. And that's uh, true throughout the lifespan. But I think maybe even more interesting, you see a number of sex differences in manifestation of disease. And that's true even in diseases where you don't see a sex difference of prevalence like in schizophrenia. So we see both neural manifestation differences and cognitive or behavioral differences with these diseases uh, based on sex. Now I'm gonna be talking mostly about sex because I'm, I'm really a biomedical researcher, but where I'm happy to talk about gender at the end. And I think you're getting an idea of why it's important to study sex differences in disease because it gives us clues on how a disease develops, the manifestation of that disease and treatment. And that treatment part is very rarely studied. It also allows us to build better models of disease. And I'm not just talking from an animal perspective, but also from a clinical perspective. You now we have a lot of failure of phase three clinical trials, a lot of um, criticisms about animal models not following human disease, but that might be because we don't understand the disease as well as we could. And the ways to, I believe that we can do this are by taking a closer examination of sex and gender. And if we have better models of disease, that's gonna give us better therapeutics. 
And obviously, if that doesn't convince you, uh, federal funding agencies are mandating incorporation. And CHR did a great job in 2010. Yes, that's when the box came out. But in terms of mandating incorporation, that, that came a little bit later. And so um, I, I would say it's around 2019 when it became a mandate, whereas NIH had uh, to, it was in 2016. So what, when you see a sex difference, what causes it? It should cue you to think that sex chromosomes are gonna be involved, sex hormones are gonna be involved as well. And also, of course, there's always a gene by environment interaction. And I'm starting to think, and this is from Jillian Einstein, a lot of interactions with Jillian Einstein, that um, those sex by environmental interactions almost like what Louise Pilot did um, in the study that Crystal was talking about, are those gendered interactions that we can, we can think about? We can argue about that at the end. I thought I'd show this slide, which is really I stole from David Page, um, because he talks about how the genome is 99.9% .9 identical between two human males. But uh, despite these similarities, you can see what a big difference that 0.1% can make in terms of phenotype. So seeing that, recognizing that the uh, there's a 15 times greater genetic difference between a human female and a human male. Uh, so that 1.5%, you can imagine how much more of a difference in phenotype that might make than uh, between two human females or two human males. Now, just so we're all on our same page on the same page, and it allows me to show a picture of my adorable adult children. Uh, when I'm talking, when every time you see a sex difference, you just think that sex hormones might be involved in some way. And when I'm talking about sex hormones, I'm talking about ovarian hormones like estrogens in females and androgens such as testosterone in males. Of course, we have each other's hormones just in different concentrations. And it's these hormones act on receptors that are located across the body, not just in the gonadal tract, just like the XX and XY are not just in the gonads, they're all in every cell in our body. And of course, it gets much more complicated than that because testosterone can be converted to a very powerful uh, of the estrogens, estradiol, and to a very potent androgen called dihydrotestosterone. And sex hormones themselves can affect both symptomology and treatment. Again, but very rarely studied in terms of that treatment as aspect. So this comes from the schizophrenia literature showing across the menstrual cycle, as estradiol levels are declining, psychotic symptoms are increasing. I wanna tell, spend a couple of minutes talking about what sex differences is not. It's not believing that males and females are polar opposite. It's not sexist, which Crystal kind of talked about as well. It's not more complicated in one sex versus the other. And it's definitely not the final step, okay? So uh, what do I mean by uh, it's not polar opposites? A lot of people um, tend to start to think about sex dimorphisms, which does mean opposite. But really we're talking about differences, differences between the sexes. It does not mean that one brain is inferior to the other. It just means that it's different. And I'll talk a little bit about, more about that. Uh, this group um, spends a lot of time talking about how the brain is, is a mosaic. Of course it's a mosaic. No one would ever, I would say in the field would ever argue that there's a female brain and a male brain, but there are differences between the brains. Not in every single brain, of course not, just like you don't see it in every single animal, but you tend to see uh, on average these differences. So this is um, from their own data looking at a number of different studies, 116 brain regions looking at brain uh, gray matter uh, volume differences each row as a person. And you can see that, yes, it's a mosaic, but you actually do see more pink on the female side and more blue on the male side, showing you that the mosaic is uh, skewed in different directions. Uh, as I said, a female brain versus a male brain, uh, uh, it doesn't mean that one, just if you, even if you find that there are gray matter volume differences in, um, in one region that favor males, that doesn't mean that the males are superior. I'm not, I'm not really sure where that actually came from. Um, uh, and so studying sex differences does not equate to sexism. A lot of people make that point, but I don't believe that's true. In fact, it's an empirical question. You know, how efficient is the system is actually more important than how big the system is. It's just important there are differences. We need to watch those biases and notions. And uh, Rebecca Shansky does a really great job of, of talking about um, why hormones are not a problem for a female problem. Uh, and uh, Crystal already showed you some of this data. This is just showing that the coefficient of variation is not different. And this was on a number of physiological characteristics in mice. They've done it in rats. I think another one's coming out in humans very soon, if it's not out already. Um, so the variability isn't different. 
The one thing I will say, uh, it's often interpreted as, well, then estrous cycle doesn't matter in a mice, because this is mouse research. Um, I would say that the, that just, this, does, this data doesn't mean that the variability in females isn't accounted for by estrous cycle. In some cases, it likely is. But it just means it's not more complicated. It's not more variable to study one sex versus the other. Let's look at a little bit of um, uh, human data as well. So here are testosterone levels in males versus females across the day. And you can see a big drop in testosterone levels uh, across the day, depending on age, uh, in males, not so much in females. So here we're talking about a daily fluctuation in hormones. In females, in males, in females, we're talking about monthly fluctuations in hormones. So just like Crystal, who's more hormonal now, I ask you? Um, we can't say that it's a female variability problem. It's certainly not. And sex hormones themselves are also influenced by age and experience. So in, in males, yeah, so this is in human males, these are testosterone levels. They drop again quite dramatically starting from the age of 30. They also drop with experience. So this is parenthood. And you can see drops in both AM and PM levels of testosterone even a year after uh, a child has been introduced into the household. So I wanted to take a moment and talk about different types of sex differences. I think a lot of people can think about qualitative differences, which is kind of what um, that neurogendered group is showing in terms of sex dimorphism, I, I would argue, um, that you might see very different behaviors. So you can think of say, sexual mating postures, for example. But there are also quantitative differences. So uh, females are more likely to show better verbal memory than males. Population differences. So uh, the example I like to use is with major depressive disorder. Uh, females are more likely to present with comorbid anxiety than males are. But I want to take a little moment to talk about these two because, and I'm going to give you some examples of both of these from the literature. And that is when something doesn't differ. So it doesn't have to be behavior. It could be a neural trait, any kind of trait that you're interested in. You might not see a sex difference, but the mechanisms um, uh, underlining that trait might be completely different in males versus females. So if you just do one study and you see, oh, there's no sex differences, I can go ahead and just look at males now, that might not be true. It might be completely different in terms of uh, the mechanisms in females. There are also examples where you might not see a difference in the trait that you're examining, but with disease or stress or genotype, you might, this might elicit the sex differences. And these are important things to consider in your research. Now, uh, just like Magdalena, I've been spending my time studying the female brain. Why? Because females have a different physiology uh, due to the fact that we're getting pregnant, uh, giving birth, breastfeeding, and providing parental care. And that's true in most mammalian species. And I'll talk about that very briefly at the end. And uh, that suggests, as I've already uh, alluded to, that the brains are going to be organized differently. I thought I'd just show this. This comes from my late master's uh, uh, supervisor's data showing that it was really prevalence of aphasia is quite different. So males are more likely to present with Wernicke's aphasia, which is a difficulty to comprehend speech, while females are more likely to present with Broca's aphasia, which is the difficulty to produce speech suggesting among other things that the brains are organized differently. So as I've said, many sex differences in brain disease, females more likely to present with depression and, and Alzheimer's disease. And while longevity plays a role, it's not the only thing. And I'll show you some evidence to support that. Whereas males are more likely to present with Parkinson's disease and as boys autism. Now, in terms of uh, late onset Alzheimer's disease, there's a triad of non-modifiable -mod risk factors. Advancing age, female sex is another one. In terms of lifetime risk, it's double the lifetime risk for a woman to develop uh, Alzheimer's disease compared to a, uh, a man. Uh, but also, uh, there's the ApoE4 status. Uh, the ApoE gene is located on uh, chromosome nine, 19. And um, it turns occurs a greater risk to develop Alzheimer's disease. And it turns out whether you have one or two of these alleles, much more of a risk if you have two alleles. But it turns out that if you're a, a female with this ApoE4 allele, you're at even higher risk than a male to develop Alzheimer's disease. So here are some examples from the literature. Um, this is looking at something called mild cognitive impairment, which is prodromal to Alzheimer's disease. And when they split this data set up into people with mild cognitive impairment versus not, so high risk versus low risk, 
no sex differences, and this is cognitive um, decline, so no sex differences in cognitive decline in the low risk group, but big sex differences here. So females in the high risk for Alzheimer's disease show more cognitive decline um, compared to males with the high risk. So suggesting that disease progression could be quite different between the sexes. Here are some sex by genotype differences. So here, uh, looking at um, APOE4 alleles, this is using that ADNI data set as well. Uh, there are no sex differences in uh, these neuropathological features of Alzheimer's disease. This comes from cerebral final, spinal fluid. So we've got tau and phospholipid tau. But with a possession of one or two of these alleles, that's when you see that females are disproportionately more likely to um, to have these uh, higher levels of neuropathology. Now, I'm a neuroscientist, so my obsession is with the hippocampus. It's related to both Alzheimer's disease and um, depression, and it's affected by both sex and stress hormones, it has a number of these receptors located throughout the hippocampus, and it's very plastic in adulthood. And the plasticity that I like to study is neurogenesis. And I'm gonna give you an example, a couple of examples of neurogenesis and sex differences. So I'm just going to spend a tiny bit of time going through this. So uh, neural stem cells reside in the granule uh, cell layer, subgranule cell layer here in the dentate gyrus. When they decide to uh, uh, produce, they form two daughter cells, at least one of which will form a mature neuron. And there are a number of components to neurogenesis. So there's that proliferation, that you know, birth of those two daughter cells. Um, and there's differentiation. So of those daughter cells, how many of them are surviving to become new neurons or new glial cells? And the way people are do this is using either using an endogenous protein of cell proliferation, that's just the production of those cells, or an uh, exogenous uh, marker, a DNA synthesis marker like bromodeoxyuridine, which you can inject into an animal. And then further on, look to see whether those new cells are either neurons um, or uh, glial cells. And you can also look at endogenous proteins of immature cells. And uh, this is uh, using double cortin, which is expressed because it's an immature cell. You can see very immature, immature neurons and very mature like immature neurons, which look like teenage cells. They're not called baby school age or teenage cells in the literature. They're called type one, type two, and type three. That's super boring. So that's why I've renamed them here for you. Okay. So like many people, we have looked for sex differences in neurogenesis in the hippocampus, and we don't see any. So either in a young adult stage or early or middle age, you don't see any sex differences. Um, but you do see a big age difference, right? Middle age, much fewer cells. And this is looking at these BRDU cells, that's, that's an exogenous marker, which we always co-label co it with a mature neuronal protein. And I'll tell you that 80% of these cells do become neurons. But being the lab that we are, this didn't stop us from looking further based on some other work that we've done. This is the work of Shinya Yagi, who's doing a PhD in my lab. And it's a bit of a complicated study. I'm not gonna show you all of it, but. Basically, he gave this DNA synthesis marker and then looked at various time points. I'm just going to show you one week, two weeks, and three weeks later. First, he looked at the production of those cells. How many of those cells are actually being produced? And he used that endogenous protein KS67. Many, uh, many more, you can see this very clearly, I think, many more of these cells were uh, reproducing, if you will, in both the dorsal and ventral sections uh, compared in males compared to females. He then looked at those neural stem cells. How many of those stem cells are actually residing in this area? And only in one region did he see a sex difference, but it was males had more of these stem cells. There's a greater capacity for males to develop, if you will, these uh, neurogenesis. He then looked at um, the maturation rate. So the way we did this was he took these BRDU uh, labeled cells and looked to see how many of them, what percentage of them were also expressing this mature neuronal protein nu N. So he looked at one week, two weeks and three weeks. And you can see at one week, there's no sex difference. And that's what we'd expect. I told you it's about 80% of these cells by three weeks are becoming new neurons. Where he saw the large sex difference was at two week time course. So many more of these BRDU labeled cells were expressing mature neuronal protein, suggesting that they're maturing at a faster rate than in males compared to females. So what I've shown you is there's no sex differences in the you know, three week old new, new, new neurons. Many, many people have shown that, including our own lab, but the pathways to get there are very different. We see sex differences in cell proliferation and neural stem cells and in early maturation, but somehow it's like the females catch up 
or the males somehow, uh, you know, lose more new neurons. And I didn't tell you the full story. It's that they're losing more new neurons. So just because in your first experiment, you don't see a sex difference doesn't mean there might not be some more coming up later on. Now, Bonnie Lee, who's doing a PhD in my lab, she's also been looking at some sex by genotype differences based on that APOE4 allele. So this is a human APOE4 uh, model in rats. And what she found was the same thing Shinya found, more of these stem cells in males compared to uh, females. And in the Alzheimer's model, and this is a middle age, we actually found something counterintuitive, more of these cells in middle age, but no, no sex difference there. But what about when she looked at um, these immature new neurons, so neurogenesis? Uh, in fact, what she saw was that it was the females with this APOE4 uh, genotype that had lower levels of immature neurons. So even though the capacity is there, there's actually a reduction in the number of these cells in middle age, which um, might be related to the fact that females with this uh, APOE4 allele are at more risk to develop Alzheimer's disease. Those are the kinds of things we're following up on. Now, I just wanna tell you about a couple more experiments. One is based on pattern separation. It's a, uh, a particular task, which I'll describe in just a second. We chose it because it is, um, relies on adult hippocampal neurogenesis, which is what I've been talking about. So Shinya uh, did this particular study where, and it's a complicated study, happy to answer questions about this afterwards. I don't have very much time, but two different contexts. One that they get shocked in, one that they don't. You present them over and over and over and over again. Uh, on the 14th day, we just gave them the, he, I me, mean, I really didn't do that much. He gave the, he put the rats into this context that they'd been previously shocked in. And we looked at their behavior, but he also looked at the activity in a number of different regions. And the way you can look at activity is by using an immediate early gene like ZIF268. And then using the slide scanner and show at Wellington's lab, he looked at a variety of different regions. We wanted to get an, a, a way of looking at functional connectivity. So does activity in one area, is it associated with activity in another area? Or is it you know, negatively or positively associated? And I'm just gonna show you the outputs in terms of a graphic. Pretty much everywhere, so you might see a negative correlation. So more activity in this region was associated with less activity in that region in females, but the opposite was true in males. And here, uh, less activity in the anterior cingulate cortex related to less activity in the dorsal serratum. It was positive in the females. So almost in every single situation, we saw the opposite functional activity. So what does that suggest to me? I think and hope what I've shown you is males can't serve as a default for females. And even if you imagine, if you gave a treatment for pattern separation because you wanted to upregulate activity in one region, that might work for males it might do the exact opposite and exacerbate the problem in females. So takeaway one, males cannot serve as default for females. Lots of reasons for that. Takeaway number two that I think is equally important is, is even when you see no evidence for sex difference in your first experiment, that does not guarantee there are no further sex differences in mechanism. So uh, I just want to spend a couple more minutes talking about something that's near and dear to my heart. Um, and Elizabeth Ryder was talking about a little bit about um, some of this that I'll present to you in just a second. So studying sex differences is the first step in understanding differences between males and females, but we do need more detailed studies to understand mechanism of disease. So this study came out a few years ago, looking at mice and rats. This is in red uh, when you see both males and females being used. So a nice uptick in the number of males and females used, a nice downtick and unspecified. That's the worst when people don't specify what sex they're using. But this is what I want you to pay attention to. Male only studies 40%, female only studies 66%, much fewer, right? You, you'd expect these to be at least equal or you'd hope that they'd be at least equal. So that was in mice and rats. We did our study, uh, study last year, which we're uh, writing up right now, looking across 10 years. This is in uh, top journals in neuroscience and psychiatry. Uh, and you can see 2009 versus 2019. Big increase in the number of studies that use both sexes, big decrease in the sex not reported. That's all good news. I am not liking this. This is inconsistent. This big uptick in this, this is when the first experiment used both sexes and then the subsequent sexes said, well, we didn't see one, so we're just gonna use males for the rest of it. I have a problem with that. I hope you see the potential problem with that based on some of the studies I just showed you. Also, uh, male only versus female only, much lower in terms of female only studies. I have a problem with this. 
uh, oh, I put this up because uh, this uh, to remind me to tell you that most people are using sex as a covariate. So they're not necessarily analyzing by sex, but they're using a covariate. And I know that a number of you do that as well. Um, and I think we're missing a lot of really important data. And I want to tell you about an asthma study, but I don't have any time, but you can ask me about it in the questions. So female health is much more than just how they differ from men's health, right? There are many experiences that are male specific, many experiences that are female specific that will alter disease risk and outcomes. And like Magdalena, I study how pregnancy affects uh, the brain both in short and long term. I want to spend uh, just a minute talking about Alzheimer's disease here. There are studies, uh, it's inconsistent, showing that there's an increased risk for Alzheimer's disease. But then Anne-Marie Delane came out and showed these studies where she did some machine learning in healthy brains to show that um, women with a number of uh, births, didn't matter if it was one or five to eight, my goodness, um, there was so associated with a less evident brain gap, so less brain aging. And the regions most strongly associated with less least brain aging were I included my very favorite um, brain area, the hippocampus. So I hope um, one of your favorite brain regions might be included there too. And that was interesting for us, or it made me feel um, uh, vindicated, I guess, because for years we've been showing that motherhood alters the trajectory of aging and, and specifically for neurogenesis. So Dr. Cindy Baja, who's on the job market right now, uh, she showed that these uh, immature uh, neurons um, were mu at much higher levels in multiparous animals. These are retired breeders. A lot of people that do re aging research will use retired breeders. And we see much more neurogenesis in retired breeders than we do in nulliparous animals. Those are animals that have never been pregnant. Now you might think, oh, that's with multiple pregnancies. But Rand Ede, who's now at McGill University doing a postdoc, she looked at one-time one um, motherhood and found the same thing in middle age, more of these um, immature neurons in uh, primiparous animals compared to nulliparous animals. Now, um, how do you reconcile this? I'm, I'm, I'm gonna very briefly tell you that I think it's related to the healthy cell bias, which um, Roberta Brinton first described. And this comes from Rena Lai's data, who shows that parity in wild type animals is associated with better performance. But in her Alzheimer's model, it's actually associated with worse performance. And uh, she's looking at latencies here. And when she looked at neuropathological features related to Alzheimer's disease, she found in the model itself, the Alzheimer's model, more of these plaques. So in other words, um, it's like a, you know, like a sex by genotype effect, but here we have a parity by genotype effect. Things are a little more uh, complicated um, than, uh, than, it, than we might originally think, and it's important to look at these. So I'm going to skip the next slide, <laughs> sorry to Bonnie, and just conclude with there are many types of sex differences, and some of these neural manifestations or mechanisms can be quite different between the sexes, and you have to look. You're never going to know until you actually look, and they might manifest after disease or stress or aging or hormones. I showed you some data that young adult males show different temporal dynamics of neurogenesis compared to females, and I also showed you that parity altered the aging trajectory of the uh, of neuroplasticity. I didn't have time to show you any of these other things, but the Essentially, it's still important to do some of these single sex studies uh, because we still need to look at how female specific experiences might impact disease risk and treatment. And for those of you that are interested in that, the, you know, the door is wide open because you look, you can, I showed you data, right? It's only like 6% of studies that are looking at female only studies. Anyway, this is the most important slide because it's my acknowledgement slide. I need to acknowledge all the amazing people that are, work in my lab and all the amazing people that have given me funding. This is, they don't all give me funding right now. This is, um, some of these agencies no longer exist, but I always put them up in the dim hopes that they will give me, that they will start to exist again and give me funding again. So thanks very much. I hope it wasn't super, super fast. A little bit, we're already at 10. Um, so we have zero time for questions. Is that what I'm learning? I guess uh, I, we have, we're, we're open for a little while. So if we could just have like five minutes for questions, if anybody has any questions, we'll do that. And then we'll do the breakout rooms for those of you that want to stay. We can also launch the poll again. I think Lucas says, is his hand up? Oh, go ahead. I do. Thanks for the, thanks for the talk so far, both of you. Um, I have a, I have a friend who's getting a PhD in neuroscience and he was talking to me. He does a lot of research on 
how um, how race affects um, uh, diseases like depression, anxiety, and things like that. And one of the things that he was saying recently is that um, race has um, many times been seen as a factor that influences the likelihood of being at risk for those diseases, but it doesn't seem to be so relevant when you actually mediate it for things like stress. Um, and so one of the things that his group is trying to do is like move away from saying, oh, this is a genetic difference and going into a mediated analysis where you show actually society kind of sucks if you're not white. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. I just wanted to know what your take is on that when it comes to sex differences as well. I, I mean, I think, um, I think gender, uh, uh, Crystal and I will agree. I mean, that would come out in a gendered effect clearly. And um, I do think there are sex by gender interactions, absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think sex by gender identity and sex by <laughs> gendered institutions and gendered relations. I, I understand the idea, and, and Crystal talked about this at the beginning, that's really t hard to tease that ap apart, right? But, so even though I'm a um, cis white, female, I've had gendered experiences that have impacted um, disease risk, absolutely, including we know that stress um, it has uh, effects on depression, right? It's one of the major contributing factors to depression. And so if you're having a lot of these, um, say, negative gendered experiences in life, that might be one reason why you see uh, greater rates of depression in, in females compared to males. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's really important. And that's why I also think it's great that CIHR has started to talk about SGBA plus. So you get that, that plus meaning those intersectional factors are really, really important. Mm -hmm. cool. Thank you. Yeah. And I mean, I, you know, it's hard enough to get people to do sex differences. But I, yeah. I, I totally see that we need to go to um, many more of these intersectional factors and social determinants of health. Those, those are really, really important yeah. and yet are not as well studied as they should be. But are you seeing people sort of slowly moving into that or is it still kind of a, a roadblock? Uh, I mean, I think there are more, Crystal, you might be more attuned, but more studies out there on this. I still yeah. think it's a roadblock. I still think there's... It's, it's definitely being encouraged more and more when you look at, you know, Health Canada and how they look at clinical trial data when, when looking at drugs and the way that it's reported. You know, I think that the, uh, the FDA has reports on post-market drug reactions and they report not just sex, but they also report uh, race and if there's any adverse drug reactions that are showing up more in particular... Um, races. So it is being looked at and reported on, but certainly not as much as it should be, I would argue. Yeah, and I know CHR is, uh, they're coming out with, I think, an anti-racism science, and this is all in its infancy at the moment, but there will be more and more resources for um, the study of adding uh, race, ethnicity into, into and integrating it into uh, human studies. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think that uh, Sh Shafali, Shafali, is her hey, name? Hey, hi. Uh, hi. Thank you guys for hosting this. Um, I actually have a concern that I was hoping to get your opinions on. We talk a lot about why it's important to do this and, um, you know, how sex differences in and of themselves should not be a reason not to study both sexes or to exclude one sex, what have you. But my concern is that in doing so, I'm not also um, educating people who have only ever worked with one sex, that you can't just take something, because historically most models were developed in males. Yeah. You can't just take something that was yeah. developed in males and apply yeah. it to, to females. Um, I'm really struggling with that as I review yeah. articles. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I was wondering how you would recommend dealing with something like that, um, both as the you know the researcher, but also as a reviewer. Yeah, I, that is super um, important, and I actually had a slide on that, but I you know I was still over time, and, <laughs> and I skipped a slide or two too. But um, 
Yeah, and there have been really great, I think some good studies out there. Probably Rebecca Shansky is best known for that, which is, so she looked at fear conditioning and noticed that females, and this has been shown lots and lots of times that males freeze more than females interpreted as better memory. But what she noticed was that the females were darting more. So she noticed that there was a different behavior. Um, and uh, and that when you looked at darting, you also saw, you know, uh, memory. Uh, and uh, Elena Kolaris, though, she's looked at uh, aggressive behaviors and she, because, you know, oh, male mice, they don't, they're the only ones that show aggression. Well, actually, if you look, if you look at detail enough, you'll actually see that females have more, some, you know, uh, ag like antagonistic behaviors, I guess. They're, um, they're not showing the same kinds of behaviors, but they are aggressive, aggressive like, and I don't know, uh, you know, I make a joke about how females tend to be a little more passive aggressive, whereas <laughs> men are maybe a little more aggressive aggressive, but I think it's in those cases important to, um, people have to do some deep dive thinking about it. So for example, we did the uh, novelty suppressed feeding task. Uh, we did it in males, you, you food deprive them, you give them lab chow uh, in the middle of a very bright field and you know it's an anxiety like task because they have to get over their anxiety of going into the bright light to get the food reward and males do it very readily first time you tried it in females they didn't go they just like it was six six hundred seconds they just like i i'm I am not that, I am not that hungry. I will stay <laughs> out here. I'm not going into that, right? But when we put Fruit Loops in the middle, that's when they went. So I don't know what that says exactly about <laughs> sex differences in, uh, and that was in rats. But uh, I think we definitely have to do a think about uh, different apparatus, different paradigms in males versus females and what makes sense. And, uh, you know, really take a good deep dive and looking at the data. I don't know if Crystal has. Um... Yeah, no, I think that's a good point. I would just say that, you know, it's not it's not just about adding in the the rules. It's also about educating people. Right. So um, how to study sex differences, the methods, if I think it's a good point that if you just make it a requirement, then, you know, people are just applying things that they've learned in males to females or they're adding them in and they don't necessarily know how to do it you know and there's people that have been studying this and this has been their area of research for a very long time so when i was at cihr this was something that we tried to do which was create the training modules you know and and educate the the people who are applying but then we also realized when we started re we did a review of the reviews oh my gosh the reviewers don't actually know how to review uh, the sgba even though they think they do so then we had to create sort of separate guidelines for reviewers on how to review sex and gender and and not be sort of encouraging people in the wrong direction because obviously if the reviewers are saying something and then you don't get funded that's a pretty big uh effective behavior change methodology right and you don't want it to be happening in the wrong way so yeah it's imperfect at this stage i would say yeah no that's a real that's really actually really fantastic point crystal i um review the educating everyone i think it's really important that uh ian graham came up with a good term which was I had a, as Crystal know, I, ha I had a little bit of concern at the beginning with CHR um, mandating this because I thought people don't, you know, the, you know, it's, it's a specialization, right? We, there have been many of us that have been studying this our entire lives and still we get hung up. Like Crystal and I, we're not arguing as much today, but we'll argue <laughs> about um, gender differences and things of that nature. Um, so there's a sort of this idea of integration and specialization. <laughs> so it's good for everyone to integrate it but you also need a little bit of specialization so you can start thinking about how to integrate it appropriately. Better. And it's gonna take time. You know, I still think we don't, we don't, you know, people are dealing with how to do social stress experiments, for example, and uh, females compared to males in terms of, of mouse studies. Now I am uh, cognizant that some people need to leave, including maybe Crystal. So please um, don't, don't, don't hesitate to drop off if you, if you need to, because I see a couple more hands up. So maybe, um, we should do like till 10, 15 and then do the breakout rooms, but Crystal, if you have to go, please. No, it's good. Got a few minutes. Sure. Dr. M, Dr. M, D, M, C. Hi, I'm Dawn MacArthur. Um, I have a couple questions. <laughs> One is, thanks very much. It's really interesting. Um, the first question is, in the most studies, Lisa, did you see an effective time of day 
on any of that as an interaction. And the second question I have, I actually put in the chat is, have you looked at the, any differences between the sex of the humans doing the research? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Jeffrey Mogul has found that uh, the sex or gender of the researcher has an effect on how much pain the animals will show. I think they show less pain to the males and more pain. And that's, we're talking about, you know, mice. I think he mostly uses mice. He does use rats too, but I think he mostly uses mice, mice. Uh, which is really, really fascinating. When I first started in research, I was in pain research as well. So uh, we did, we did it in snails, but anyway, they're, they're, um, yeah, and people have done it also with a force swim test in terms of, um, uh, uh, which is a depressive light behavior, and they've seen a few differences. You know, I think, I think there's a couple of things to consider there. One is um, Hans Selye, who is like the father of all stress research. He, he became, he became interested in stress research because he didn't handle the animals well. So I think there's a, there's, you know, um, something to be learned with how well people habituate the animals, how well they handle the animals. And so there might be some inherent, inherent gender slash sex differences in that, um, as well as pheromone. You know, we, in my lab, we talk about don't wear perfume, don't change, uh, you know, your uh, shampoo or whatever throughout your study, that kind of stuff, because who knows what's going to uh, influence things. Um, and it, it's, we have mostly in my lab, I have females, so I, I can't really do, I do have a few males at work, but um, I can't quite do that myself, but I certainly can look over at it um, across, across the years of my own lab. Um, in terms of time of day, yeah, we always, always keep that as a, um, uh, a variable. So um, uh, animals will be, um, uh, put in paradigms at a certain time of day. And so we'll do it in cohorts if we have to, just to make sure that we get the same kind of three hour window. And the reason you do that is for those diurnal rhythms and hormones that I talked about at the, at the beginning. But yeah, that makes it, that makes a huge difference. I don't know if Crystal wants to. Yeah, I mean, I've been in Jeff's lab and he actually has one woman, the last time I was in there, one woman who does all of his mice experiments and no one else is even allowed to go no. in the, actually not no one else, no males are allowed to go in the wow. room because what he found when he was doing that and when he realized that was they could even take the sweater of the, the male research assistant and leave it in the room and it had the same stress effect on the mice. So um, women only for the, for the mice pain studies in Jeff's lab. Can I just quickly add something? So like in my master's and PhD, which are all on hibernating rodents, women were way better at getting them to hibernate than men were. <laughs> and so you're, the, there's just, uh, we know that from a stress hormone and sort of biological phenomenon that there's, there's individual human differences in how the animals respond mm -hmm. to the handler, whether it's male, female, whatever the gender identity of the person is. And so it, it actually had something to do with the way people were trained mm. more than with their actual sex or gender identity. Makes, that makes sense to me too. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the thing, right? Research is very uh, complex and complicated. <laughs> and so you wanna make sure that you have best practices just in your lab in general. And that's, I mean, when I, I started in, in human research, I think I said I started in pain research, which is not really true. Well, it depends on what you're talking about started. But anyway, um, so I did some human studies with Doreen Kamira and we had a script that we always followed. So you couldn't deviate when you tested one subject versus the other, right? You had to basically follow that script. And you know, there's no joking or flirting or, yeah. and, and that makes sense because then you're doing these tests afterwards and you wanna make sure that they're, that everybody has been treated the same way. But I'm, I'm certain that there's gonna be some, and I, I think there are some studies out there, right? Where they've done some manipulation of sex, gender of uh, researcher mm -hmm. for human research and seen some differences Absolutely. as well. Um, I, I know I said uh, 10, 15, but Stella, you've had your hand up. So I just wanted to give you a chance. And there's something in the chat I really wanna respond to, but I don't think I'll have time. Anyway, Stella, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. Um, yeah, so I was thinking more about um, the um, in our lab looking at metabolism and specifically genetic models and um, so now especially because I'm looking at insulin in the brain in the hippocampus and for us especially because we're doing a lot of breeding we don't really like nobody really looks at these things or what what would be some uh, 
fundamental considerations, especially when you when the differences in the breeders, is there then also differences in the offspring? And how should we, what would be the strategy to set up the experiment so we can really truly identify what I'm looking at if this is so sensitive to the hippocampus specifically, like how am I gonna know, um, yeah. you know? It, yeah, especially if there's such few uh, new neurons in adulthood, like it's, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, gets, it feels daunting sometimes, doesn't it? I, I think um, what I tell my own lab is, um, you know, write everything down, right? You know, what, you know, you should know the history of the animal that you have, uh, that you're looking at in terms of human, um, you know, uh, certainly there are a number of questionnaires you can ask people at the very beginning, um, but you know, you, you all of that takes time, so you have to you know balance that. Um, but uh, um, yeah, I mean, I think that, that I can talk quite a bit about uh, the specific things in terms of metabolism, and Liz Rideau is probably better able to answer some of those questions uh, than I am. But um, I think all of those things that you mentioned. Uh, uh, will affect it. And Crystal talked about paternal. Um, you know, I know that opioid exposure also in, in for fathers makes a difference in terms of offspring in mm -hmm. humans as well as in animals. So uh, animal models. So all of that matters, not just the, you can't just always blame the mom and the maternal, no. also no. the males as well. Um, so would you make sure to, um, uh, document all of that and then put it, let's say, in the supplementary or like. Um... Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really also another thing. Like, people will, I know that there's a lot of recommendations of editors, if I'm an editor, right? And even for my small journal, it's, I, you know, I always ask people to talk about sex or gender. And if they, you know, always put a part in there, like at least a paragraph in there talking about it. Um, but I'm, positive that some over the last four years, I probably missed some, you know, because we're all busy people, right? And I'm not going to be able to read every single paper and I'm trusting the reviewers to do it, but it doesn't always happen, right? So some things will slip, slip through the cracks, but yeah, people have talked about star methods, I think is one, right? Mm -hmm. Where, you know, we can start putting like checklists of all of these things in the methods. I do have a big problem with journals that don't put methods up front when they put them at the back. I think that's a big problem. <laughs> um, Crystal, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add. Nope. <laughs> All right. Well, um, so the other thing I thought about was, uh, you know, there's so much to talk about and so many different things we could have uh, highlighted. So I'm hoping that through the cluster, um, I think uh, Elizabeth Radit is, is going to do some of this. I don't know if she's still on the call, but have other kinds of workshops that will be available to talk about some of these things. And in the last little bit, we're going to do some breakout rooms. So if you have more questions for people and maybe I'll be going back and forth, I don't know. Um, Catherine, can you put those breakout rooms out so people can choose their breakout room? There we go. So uh, you, can, you can, I think, um, choose your room. So if at the bottom of the list, you'll see sex differences in biomedical research, data analysis, and clinical research. So um, if you want to join one of those, please join. And those of you that are mediating those breakout rooms, make sure you go in the right room. <laughs> and somebody asked about that, um, uh, Arpena Gupta, about the recent meta-analysis. I loved it. I actually haven't read it yet because it made me angry. <laughs> I know I should uh, read yeah. it, but that's the same group that uh, I'm sure that person's gone. Maybe that's the same group that um, has a, ha always wants to see. Oh, says that there's no dimorphism. Yeah, there's no dimorphism. So, um, yeah, and I, I hope I showed that it's not just about volume, but other things yeah. as well. Exactly. Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully. But I do have to read it before I can really comment. Rail on it. <laughs> exactly. exactly. I mean, I think it's an I'm important gonna, perspective, but you're going to go head out, Lisa. Okay, thank you so fun. much. It's too bad we didn't argue too much today. I know. Nobody had any questions that would have triggered it. Yeah. Nature, nature versus nurture, hormones versus society. I know. So disappointing. <laughs> so disappointing. But I don't want to I don't want to anymore because you have a black belt, so <laughs> Well, we're not going to be physically in the same space That's for a true. while, so. That's true.
Yeah. Thank you very much, Crystal. Yeah. Thanks. Talk to you later. I guess I can have my own breakout room too. <laughs> so if you don't want to join one, but you want to hang out with me, I'm also happy to answer questions. I have a question for you, Lisa. Sure. Hi, hi again. Hi. Um, yeah, the thing is that um, I was, I was hoping to know more specifically, more specifically, how you think I should include the gender question in our studies. I don't, I'm I'm working with Susana Carmona. I think you know her, and we are we are doing all of these um, longitudinal studies um, with with pregnant mothers. But now we are starting um, with non-pregnant mothers too. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I've. I realized that we are not incorporating the gender thing. Right. Like we are not, we are not incorporating um, any question. And I'm sure that you can recommend me how to like. Do you think that it's enough to to include one question and ask like, do you identify as women or men, or 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 we need to, you know, like be more specific? So what I think is being rec what I know is being recommended right now is to um, I mean it might not be as important in exactly the say you're doing but if you ask do you identify as a woman or a man uh, trans trans women are women so they're going to say women so you're going to sort of miss that part of um, you know that sort of gender diversity if you will mm -hmm. so if you want to get at that question the recommendation is to say ask you know what sex were you assigned at birth male versus female and then ask do you identify as man woman um, non-binary okay and so there are a number of questions that you can ask uh, and i am pretty sure cigr has their recommendations up so i can um if you email me i can try and find you that that uh, list yeah, and it's evolving, that's a thing. These questions end up evolving quite a bit because the communities, like the trans community will come, they were the ones that brought that to, to uh, Institute of Gender and Health um, notice to say, hey, this is, this is who, you're gonna miss our population if you ask the question this way. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's um, a pity because we are running longitudinal studies and when yeah. we incorporate the question, maybe like, yeah. Four years later, we're still collecting the data and yeah. then changes, and we're like, "Oh my god!" Right. But um, yeah, okay. I will. Yeah. So basically, it's better to include like both the the sex that you were assigned and then the gender. But anyway, I will I will email you. Um, sure. Yeah. Sure. No problem.